I'm Juita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. What is blindness? For an answer, perhaps it's helpful to start with what blindness is not. Blindness isn't merely an absence of sight. Blindness is a central identity for some, a neutral or marginal characteristic for others. Not all blind people are the same. There are blind vegetarians, athletes, academics, you name it. Some people have been blind from birth. Others lose their vision as adults. Blindness can come on suddenly or gradually. Blindness is then more than a physical experience. It has its own culture, language, and politics. Blindness is not the same for any two blind people, any more than sight is experienced the same way by two-sighted individuals. Today, we explore the country of the blind. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I'm Juita Gupta. My guest today is Andrew Leland. Andrew is a an writer, audio producer, editor, and teacher. He's also the author of The Country of the Blind, a memoir at the end of sight. Andrew, hello and welcome to The Pulse. I'm delighted you could join us. Oh, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. The Country of the Blind is, of course, a book written by H.G. E. Wells. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about why that particular story and the title resonated with you to the extent that you wanted to adopt it, at least as a starting point yeah. for your own memoir and your own investigation into blindness? Yeah. So Wells is, a, is an early science fiction writer and his short story, The Country of the Blind, is about uh, an explorer who's on a mountain expedition in the Andes and then a landslide separates him from his expedition crew. And he falls into this secret forgotten valley um, where a civilization of exclusively blind people has lived for generations without sight and developed into this blind society where there's their language has no word for sea. You know, they built the, the built environment, the, the, their streets and their buildings all are designed uh, with blindness in mind. And, and to the degree that there is no reference to sight. It's not like an alternative. It just is, you know, the, the mainstream existence there is blindness and they don't have any sense of anything else in the same way that, you know, in a lot of ways, um, mainstream society, you know, outside of the sci-fi realm uh, is sort of built for the non-disabled person. And I borrowed the title for my own book, my own nonfiction exploration of blindness, my own and, and you know, that of society and other others, uh, because... I kind of identified with the character in that story, this, this sighted explorer who sort of arrives with a very separate sense of himself as like, you know, he keeps on repeating to himself in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And he thinks like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to dominate these people. Not that I had this, this colonial attitude towards blindness, but I definitely, as a sighted person becoming blind, felt a, a degree of alienation that felt important to me to really reckon with and not reckon with in a way that was just immediately dismissive and to say like, well, that's bad. I don't want to be that way. So I'm just going to reject it. But, but, you know, as I think a lot of writers before me have done to sort of dismantle my own, my own received notions and to think about where they came from, why I felt the way I did about blindness, and then to really try to disabuse myself in that way and, and figure out what blindness actually is. And so the country of the blind you know, my my book is the sort of nonfiction attempt to do what what Nunez does in the fictional version, which is to like explore the country and figure out what my place in it is. Mm. And so, in writing your memoir, it's not just a retelling of your personal experience. Obviously, being a memoir, there's a lot of that, but you go a lot deeper. You interview a lot of people. You go a lot of places. You go to the NFB convention, the National Federation of the Blind Convention, and other places. You read an absolutely staggering number of books. Talk <laughs> to me a little bit about your process and in pulling this memoir together, because it looks like it was an effort that might have taken many years. It did take many years. Yeah, thank you. Um, it uh, I'd never written a book before, and but I've, but I've worked in publishing and worked with writers for a long time. So it felt the stakes were very high for me, um, just as they would be, I think, if it was writing a book about you know, candy or, or uh, dogs or anything. But, you know, there was the added responsibility, I think, of the 
the personal aspect of it, you know, writing about the intimate parts of my own life, but also the feeling that I was writing about a community that I barely belonged to at the beginning. You know, I barely had a sense of myself. And so I think that it, it seemed to require a lot of sensitivity. And I really wanted to make sure I did my homework. And, you know, and it really felt like there was some really interesting writing about blindness, but in a lot of ways compared to uh, many other subjects that I could have taken on, you know, it, it felt like there were a lot of gaps in the record and in not just in the record, but in, in the general understanding of the subject. So I think I felt like I had to work extra hard to fill in those gaps and to, to think like, okay, well, so if this is misunderstood, how is it misunderstood? And so, uh, yeah, so I dug pretty deep into, you know, everything from representations of blindness, like that H.G. Wells story to sort of histories of, of blind people in, you know, medieval times, ancient times, you know, in the enlightenment and tw early 20th century, you know, my focus ended up inevitably being kind of biased, I think, towards the West and towards North America by virtue of the fact that I'm here. But also, I think if you, this is a story in a lot of disability history. There's just, you know, the, the sort of writing of disability history beyond the sort of Western context is, is, is still emerging in a lot of cases in terms of its accessibility to scholars and, and writers. Uh, uh, so, so that's all to say that, yeah, I felt like I needed to, to do my homework in that way. Yeah. In the opening pages of your book, you say, I can't just accept blindness as a visual death sentence. Uh, in fact, you know, this this sense that blindness was not the end of, of the way that your, your world was, uh, is the beginning of your curiosity around um, the book and wanting to explore. What is it that sparked curiosity in you? Because, you know, you could have had a different reaction, which is, oh my gosh, I'm losing my vision. I'm just going to I don't know, dive under the covers and hide. So what is it in you that, that sparked curiosity where others might have felt fear? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I have a disease called retinitis pigmentosa or RP. And one of the ways that it works, at least for me, but I think for a lot of people with RP, there's a range of experiences, is that it's incredibly slow. And so I was diagnosed as a teenager. Um, at the time, I was still driving at night during the day. I didn't own a cane or even know where I would find one, you know, and and it took decades for me to hit the point that I am now where I, you know, I use a white cane whenever I leave the house and I use a lot of assistive technology from screen readers to Braille. Um, and, and so those decades in between those two points, I think gave me a lot of time to, to think about it and, you know, and also a lot of time to avoid it and to, 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 to sort of experience that denial that I think you're alluding to that a lot of people losing their vision, whether it's from RP or anything else whether it's fast or slow, you know, I think denial is a common part of the vision loss experience, you know, and, and I'll add an asterisk there that, you know, I know people who are, who are congenitally blind, who are born blind, for whom the, the phrase vision loss is, is sort of deeply irritating because they, you know, they didn't lose vision, right? They, they, they grew up blind. But, but I think, you know, speaking from the, the sort of vision loss perspective, denial is a really powerful force that, one can, like you said, have a, a lot of different reactions to. And I think I, I certainly did. And I still do, you know, it's like, I kind of had this expectation that I would write this book and be like, nailed it, figured it out, you know, I'm done. And, and of course, it's not like that. It's this sort of ongoing practice that there are days when I just leave my screen reader off, and I burn my eyes out, and I just like pretend like I don't have to deal with it. And then I pay, I pay the price for it later. But, um, but, but I think, yeah, I don't really know like the deeper answer to your question of how I got to the place of curiosity winning out over denial, except I also think that that the privilege that I have is a part of that. You know, I think it's it's a lot easier for me to spend the time researching the history, intellectual history of blindness and, you know, accessing technology that make my work easier. And the fact that my work is this sort of like, you know, highly white collar, you know, journalist, professor world, you know, all those things. I think if they were different, if I didn't have access to those resources or the time to pursue that stuff, you know, I think it would be a lot easier to, to stay in that place of denial. So privilege is a big part of it, too, I think. Yeah. How do you think the book balances uh, intellectualizing blindness or theorizing blindness with the material reality of blind people and the emotional reality of blind people? Not that those things are necessarily opposed to one another or they're off in their own boxes, but, you know. There is a sense that there's a binary there. Yeah, absolutely. I've thought, I've thought a lot about that. Um, I had a friend who told me something like, I'm trying to quote him correctly, but he said something like, 
I think you, you feel with your brain. Um, and I'm, he was, he was sort of, we, he was comparing the two of us, uh, you know, and he, and after reading my book, he said, I think you're like me, you, you feel with your brain. And I really like that, you know, which is the idea. I mean, it kind of gives the lie to the sort of head heart binary, you know? And I think, I think there's a way that you can pursue something as intellectual as, you know, studying the intellectual history of blindness or disability, um, you know, or doing this sort of journalism slash, you know, his history, criticism, writing, um, and have it, have it be emotional and have it connect, you know, and I think the other part that kept me honest in that regard is just kind of like a literary formal problem I had, which was that I didn't want to write a book that was pure memoir that was just like, you know, dear reader, this is who I am. This is my life story. This is my journey of, you know, a vision loss. But I also didn't want to write the academic version, you know, that, that was, that was purely historical, that, that elided my experience. And so my editor was really helpful on that point because she was constantly pushing me to say either, you know, where did all the Borges and Homer and Milton go, you know, like that was a sort of shorthand for like the intellectual stuff, right? Like you've promised the reader all of this history and all of this, you know, literature and, and ideas. Where is that? Where like we've been stuck too long and you like figuring out how to clean your kitchen, you know, and then conversely, she would say, uh, I don't care about this like deep dive you're doing into the history of audio description. Like you've lost the sort of personal urgency that so much of this other material feels, you know, and, and and it was tough to that, that, that balance was the hardest part of writing the book. And I was constantly, I would constantly have to ask myself, like, am I including this history of audio description just because I kind of feel a duty to, because I know it blind, matters to blind people a lot, or is it somehow connecting to something that's urgent in my own experience that can kind of help me explain this world to myself? And so the more honest I could have, the more honest I was about the stakes that I felt, you know, the skin that I had in the game, I think the, the better that mix became and, and, and the more that division between the sort of intellectual and the emotional felt like it was dissolving in, in the work. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking to myself that if I had to sit down to try and write the book that you've written, the challenge that I would encounter is I'd start, but I'd never stop <laughs> <laughs> because there's no finite amount that can be said about blindness or anything for that matter. And yes, there are many interesting and compelling portions of your book, but I think you'd also agree there are things that were left out that you could have, you know, maybe you'd revisit in a, in a second edition or something. Uh, where did you decide to draw the line or how did you decide, okay, well, this is where I stop? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, the, the, the kind of cheeky sounding answer that is also very serious uh, is, you know, that's why God created deadlines, you know, and I haven't worked in <laughs> publishing. <laughs> there, there's a beauty, you know, the deadlines are terrible and they, they create all, all, no end of, of anxiety and stress, but also, they're a blessing, right? Because at a certain point, you have to you have to hit save and hit print. And so that's the easy answer. It's just like I ran out of time and space and had to had to finish. Uh, you know, in terms of like the hard decisions that did get made around what to include and what to leave out. You know, my ed editors are are incredibly helpful there. And again, like my editor, I think was a really good sounding board for telling me about the places that I thought were super. Interesting, but she just, she was just like, you're losing us here, you know? And then that, and that was the tricky thing about the audience of the book too, is, you know, there's stuff that I think, you know, like I, I'm, I'm sort of stuck on the example of the deep dive on audio description, which I do do, like I do include a lot of stuff about audio description, but my first draft had like, you know, 200% more, um, you know, and I think it, it's, it's, it's almost, it's it, part of it is like an artistic balance of like, what's the story I'm trying to tell, like how how much do we need here to tell this story and what, what feels right, what keeps the pages turning. And part of it is, yeah, like a feeling of obligation to really like, like hit the main notes. Um, but I think for me, it all comes back to what I already said about, you know, my own stakes. And like, I don't know, somebody accused me at a, at a reading of, of leaving out the history of guide dogs, for example, you know, and I do, I write briefly about, about guide dogs in this sort of section around interdependence. And, but you know, it's really like a, a paragraph or two. And, I totally admit guide dogs are a really fascinating and important part of the history of blindness. But like, this is not a history of blindness. It's not like the definitive, like, if you want to know everything there is to know about blindness, that's my book. It's a, you know, it's a very subjective, uh, you know, it does try to cover a lot of ground, but, it, but, 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 but fundamentally it's, it's, it's driven by my own experience and my mm -hmm. own interests. 
Well, exactly. That's what I was thinking. If I had to write your book, I'd probably skip over blind sports. To, you know, I, I don't an adaptive sports because that's not really something that is in my scope of experience. One of the things that really intrigued me, um, and I say this because, you know, I'm a women and gender studies uh, student. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting was your analysis of blindness and the male gaze. Talk us through some of your thinking around that. Yeah, you know, that's an example of something that uh, some friends and early readers sort of tried to dissuade me from pursuing. Um, that, but that was always fascinating to me. And, and, it, and, and, you know, it's, it's, I think they, I think people steered me away from it because it feels risky. Cause I, you know, I think some of the questions I was asking felt, um, I don't know, they felt, they felt risky because I was, some of the questions I was asking were like, okay, you know, it's, 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 it's all fine for people to talk about, you know, missing, the loss of, you know, like art or, 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 or nature or seeing things, but like, what about the loss of that kind of sexual desire that comes from, some, from vision, you know, that sort of like looking at, um, physical sexual desire that comes through, through sight. And, um, and it was a, it was a, it was a surprisingly complex question to try to answer. And, you know, those are always, I think the signs as a writer where you, it's worth pursuing if it's like, People are kind of pushing you away from it, and it's not. There's no easy answer, and it won't. And, and above all, like when 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 it kind of won't let go. Like it's like there's something here that 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 needs investigation. And so, um, you know, that chapter, the male gaze, is really about not only sort of that question of like how do blind people um, experience sexual desire without vision, but 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 also just about how how gender and sexual identity are bound up in ability and disability and vision and, and blindness. And, um, you know, and again, like it's, it's from my own perspective. So thinking about my role as a husband and as a father, but also trying to, to really expand out and thinking about, you know, people like Bill Cosby or Steve Wynn, these sort of high profile me too cases of, of men who have committed, you know, terrible sexual assaults, um, and then use their blindness as a sort of an alibi or sort of like, you know, like adopting the stereotype about blind or, or really disabled people as sort of asexual as a sort of foil to hide behind and, you know, going back to, to the Greeks and Oedipus and, um, and everything in between. So that, that's sort of an example of the scope of the book of like mixing together my own thinking about these things and then trying to bring in the, 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 the historical, uh, examples and the contemporary examples to illuminate them. You come at the question of what blindness is in so many different ways. You know, you talk, you, you, you mentioned audio description, and then there's an excellent chapter on technology, which was really illuminating for me. And, uh, you know, tons of, of experiences around blindness, you know, the legal reality, the advocacy side of things, um, the, the medical realities of being blind. Um, I'm wondering if, after writing the book, uh, you can say conclusively one way or the other if there is a distinct culture of blindness. And the, the reason I say this is because I feel that there is a very distinct culture around, there's a very distinct deaf culture, for example. And you mentioned this in your book as well. But I have myself wrestled with whether there is, in fact, a distinct blind culture or blindness culture. Having written the book, do you have any thoughts about it? Uh, I do, yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's inarguable that the, the blind culture is very minimal compared to deaf culture. And, you know, I think the best hypothesis I have for why that is, is, is just the linguistic one that, that language is really like the bedrock of, 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 of building a culture. And because deaf community has sign language, you know, that, that creates that, that, you know, you can have something like a deaf university or a deaf uh, language community and blind people, hearing blind people don't have that. They're, they're part of the, the, the verbal, you know, the, the spoken language community that they're, that they're connected to more. Um, I, but that said, I definitely have noticed proclivities and, and sort of styles, uh, of just modes of being, I guess, like, you know, like lifestyles almost that, that a lot of blind people share and that when blind people do gather and there are, ba there are barriers to their gathering, but I think when, when blind people do form communities, there is a character to them and, you know, I think with the internet and just with the research I've done, I, certainly there are many, many blind people who don't consider themselves parts of this community, you know, and I think there's a tendency in, in the media in particular, but also just sort of popularly for people to talk about the blind community by which they just mean like any blind person anywhere on the planet, you know, but of course that's sort of a fiction. 
but you know, there are actual blind communities, whether it's like a political organization or like a local meetup, you know, and, 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 and thinking about blind, the challenge of blindness in terms of accessing information, you know, whether it's, um, you know, the visual information of the internet or books or, you know, even just navigation and like, and signage and stuff. So, you know, that creates these sort of hackers, you know, uh, you know, and in that technology chapter, I write about blind people being very bound up in like the origins of hacker culture in the U S for instance. And, and so I think, you know, if I see a through line, it's like blind people are they're 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 it, no, not, not, not that they're like it workers necessarily, but like most blind people I know have some degree of deep investment in media and information technology that I think exceeds just like being a, a digital citizen that, that, that to a different degree, every person in the global North has to be, uh, or even really, really globally at this point. Um, and that there's a sort of a special relationship with tech that comes from those challenges. So that's, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the part of that, of that chapter that resonated with me was the fact that so many blind people are enmeshed in technology are early adopters and have really pushed the needle. Um, but it hasn't really resulted in a lot of advancement for blind people themselves in the tech world. So that was a really that was, I thought that was very thought provoking, uh, given that, you know, this, uh, like you said it yourself in the book, it's one long journey of troubleshooting with, you know, occasional periods when things go smoothly. Do you think there was something in the book that took you by surprise? Because there were aspects as a reader where I sat up and said, oh, wow, I'd never thought about it before. But what was that in the, what in the book might've taken you most by surprise? Huh. You know, towards the end of the book, when I really had to make a, a deep effort to draw some conclusions. Um, there was a sort of paradoxical conclusion that I came to, which, which, which did surprise me sort of as, even as I was writing it and feeling convinced by it, which is this idea that, you know, I went into the book with the sense that back to the HG Wells story that, that like that I was, I was this adventurer, you know, I was this, you know, it was a travelogue and we, we were going to this exotic place called the country of the blind, you know, and as I just told you, you know, there are these sort of significant differences of the experience you know there's one can't argue that the blind experience is you know uh just about the same as the sighted experience there there, there are profound differences but even through all of that you know and, and the experience of like spending a month at her sleep shades at a training center there was this kind of core feeling of of a lack of difference and and it's if it might sound paradoxical, but I don't actually think it is. And it's and it's so I think the surprise was just the simplicity, but also the power of that realization that yes, blindness requires its own domain and it requires its own tools, but like fundamentally, it's a component of the human experience that is not radically different from from the rest of being just being alive. And that you know, for me, like at the beginning, it, it feels radically different, right? And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm. I'm, I'm listening to this robot read me a website instead of seeing with my eyes or like, wow, I'm reading through my fingers and that's so wild. But like, you know, you, you spend an hour reading in either of those two modalities and you're just reading again, you know, and it's like, okay, I know what's on that website now or okay, like I read that poem and I happened to read it in Braille, but still read it, like still thinking about the lines in my head the same way I would otherwise. And so, yeah, the biggest surprise was just like the, the deep normality of blindness. Mm -hmm. One of the things the book does is introduce us to several tensions, uh, you know, that between advocating for the blind specifically versus cross disability coalition and organizing, you know, disability justice work versus just organizing for the blind. Uh, then there's the other, you know, issue that runs that we encounter again and again in the book, are blind people somehow special? Uh, and or, you know, is it just uh, and or do they require or are they just like everybody else? And, you know, there's this whole tension about uh, do you feel like the book in any way helped you resolve some of these tensions or are you still undecided on these questions yourself? Um, probably a little bit of both. You know, I think I'd certainly have a better handle on how to ask the question to myself of, for instance, like, is blindness incidental or is it central or do blind people require accommodations or should they just, you know, with with sort of basic accommodations, you know, not need any additional uh, extra accommodations, you know, those sorts of questions. I feel like if even if I don't have the answer, I have a much stronger sense of of like what the contours of the debates are. And but but it's also I'm still very much at the beginning. You know, I I I, I still have some residual vision that in some ways I think still messes with my head. 
you know, it makes me feel like I'm not fully in the world of blindness, even though that's something that I go back and forth on. But, you know, like a lot of these questions, whether they're like the really personal identity questions or the more political identity questions that you're bringing up, you know, it, it, I think my philosophy is that as soon as I think that I have a firm answer, that's not going to change day to day based on what I'm encountering, then it becomes dogma and then I'm in trouble. And so I really try to stay, you know, as I think a, a journalist or a nonfiction writer should, like I need to stay attentive to the ways that my own thinking are, are changing, but also the ways that the world is changing and that there's complexity out there that I need to sort of meet on a daily basis. And so I try to think of it as an evolving process rather than like, yep, like my book is a mathematical proof that you can read the conclusions <laughs> and, and, and you know, QED. If, if if only life were that simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's, that's uh, and, the joy of of, of of writing and of life, right? It's like yes, know, we get yes. to continue discovering and continue being surprised, even if it's also profoundly inconvenient at times. <laughs> Andrew Leland, thank you very much for joining me on the program. It was a pleasure to have you. Oh, likewise. This is great. That was Andrew Leland, author of The Country of the Blind, a memoir at the end of sight. The book is published by Penguin, Penguin Random House and is also available as an audiobook in addition to the usual format. So I hope you'll pick up a copy. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We would love to get your feedback on the program. You can write to us at feedback at ami.ca or find us on X at AMI Audio. You can also give us a call at 1-866-509-4545. That's 1-866-509-4545. And don't forget to leave permission to play the audio on the program. If you are watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, please do remember to subscribe so that you can be notified about future videos and do write in your thoughts and comments down below. We do try to get to comments as, uh, as often as, as we can. And I do try to respond personally as much as I am able to. So please feel free to reach out and share your experiences of blindness. Uh, if you are someone who's been congenitally blind or you have someone uh, or you're someone who's losing your vision later in life, we would love to hear your experiences of, of what blindness has actually meant to you. So feel free to to let them those comments rip down below. Uh, but as I said, we do have to wrap up for today. Our videographer today has been Matthew McGurk. Jordan Steves is our video editor. Marka Flalo is our technical producer. Ryan Delahanty is the coordinator for AMI Audio Podcasts. Andy Frank is the manager for AMI Audio. And I've been your host, Joita Gupta. Thanks so much for listening.